which will be described in more detail later. For the present it will suffice to state that James actually arrived in Paris on 24 March, 1811, took up his quarters at 5 Rue Napoleon without being hindered, and duly reported himself to the police. At this time the Rothschild family were kept very much on the move. Apart from their own business, all the members of the family who were capable of traveling were constantly on the road, in order to transact personally the important business of the elector at various places. This is most clearly revealed in the correspondence between Budarus and the elector. Young Rothschild, he wrote from Hanau to his master on April 7, 1811, is actually on his way to London to fetch the certificates of title regarding your investment of capital. He can take the packet of letters with him. His father will gladly make an effort to get the things away from Godhorpe, and is already making inquiries on this matter. On my advice Crown Agent Rothschild has called in the capital payment due at Copenhagen, and has received 159,600 gulden. Will your electoral highness graciously permit me to convey to Crown Agent Rothschild your highness's satisfaction regarding his manifold activities on your behalf? I am informed by Crown Agent Rothschild that the Prague police have discovered the secret drawers in his carriage. I have therefore thought it advisable not to send my account for last month with the other documents, on this occasion, as it cannot be concealed under the clothes as letters can. The elector rewarded such news with expressions of genuine satisfaction, and agreed that Rothschild should be acquainted with his satisfaction with him. He was, however, still concerned about the money which he had invested in English stock, in respect to which he had not yet received any document of title. I feel a real longing, which I think is justified, he replied to Budarus, to see the documents regarding the investments. I had not been informed that the police here had discovered the secret hiding place in the carriage. In any case there is no reason to expect anything untoward from that quarter. Budarus was unceasing in his efforts to exalt the Rothschild family in the opinion of the elector, and to represent all other business houses as unreliable or less accommodating. This was shown in the case of a transaction of earlier origin. The elector had transferred to Mayor Emil Rothschild and two other Jewish bankers from Castle an amount of a million Dutch gulden due to him in Holland. In accomplishing this various technical difficulties arose which delayed the payment of the sum in Holland, while the transferees of the debt had already paid out the greater part of the sum involved. Before making further payments, they naturally asked the elector for a guarantee. In righteous indignation Budarus reported this to his master, the worst of this business is that it was not entrusted to one single business firm. The agents Steuben Hess Goldschmidt and the heirs of Michel Simon are most ill-disposed toward your electoral highness. Levy, Simon's son-in-law, who manages the business, has gone to such extremes that, as I know for certain, he caused the recent arrest of myself and Rothschild and furnished the police commissary with the questions on which we were cross-examined with extreme severity. Budarus had proposed that the castle Jews should be made to retire from the business, and that the matter should be entrusted to Mayor Emil Rothschild alone. The elector concurred in this proposal, and replied as follows. I have read with great interest the reports regarding the Dutch loan of a million gulden. You are quite right in holding that it is essential to keep the castle Jews out of this business, although I have always regarded Goldschmidt as an honorable man. I fear that these Jews will not trust the Frankfurt agent, Rothschild, and will imagine that there are heavy profits at issue, and demand high compensation for retiring. In the end the elector left the whole matter to Budarus, and he accordingly put it all in Rothschild's hands. In general, however, the elector was again in an exceedingly bad mood, first, because Rothschild had still not succeeded in bringing his property from Holstein to Prague, and secondly, because he had received a report from Budarus regarding an electoral loan which had been made to a family called Plettenberg through the intermediary of Prince Wittgenstein, the recovery of which seemed highly doubtful. He was also annoyed by a suggestion made by Budarus that he should again take part in Frankfurt loans, of which he had had such an unfortunate experience. It was in a highly nervous condition that he awaited the documents regarding his investment in English stocks, which had not yet come to hand. This mood found expression in an exceedingly angry letter, in which the elector notified the cessation of payments to Rothschild in respect to the English stocks, 
thereby causing a positive panic in the Rothschild Buddha's firm. In the course of this letter he said, After all, my trunks and chests in Holstein contain something more than clothes. There are Hessian debentures, and accounts of various kinds, and a chest containing silver. I will arrange to have them brought to me here direct, for I am weary of giving instructions in this matter to the house of Rothschild year after year. I shall dispatch the draft letter to Prince von Wittgenstein, regarding the Plettenberg loan affair, but do not expect that it will have much result. The whole business is a network of intrigue, and I am absolutely determined to sacrifice everything rather than involve myself further with that prince. He has behaved in a shockingly irresponsible way toward me. I am not inclined to take part in the Frankfurt subscription loan. I am sick of all loans, and I really prefer to have my money lying idle. Nothing had yet arrived from London, a fact which particularly exasperated the elector. I am exceedingly worried about this matter, he wrote, and am most eagerly waiting to hear what you have to say. In the meantime you are to cease making any further payments with respect to these stocks, neither are you to invest in them any further English interest payments. I am still waiting in vain for the documents regarding the capital which I have invested. And in spite of all the confidence which I have in Rothschild, I cannot tolerate this delay any longer. Neither has the registration of the older stocks been effected yet. Lawrence is constantly and emphatically reminding you of this matter. You must see that he is kept fully informed of all my financial affairs in England, and especially of the investments effected through Rothschild, in order that he may keep an eye on them as it is his duty to do, as my charge d'affaires. You are to see to this without delay. The elector's fears had been increased by letters from Lawrence, his plenipotentiary in London, who was offended because he had not been taken into the confidence of Buddhas and Rothschild in the business which they were transacting for the elector in England. He had suggested to his master that England might conclude an unfavourable peace, which would cause a heavy fall in British stocks, and therefore advise the sale of the securities which had only just been purchased. Buddhas replied to his master in a very injured tone, stating that in accordance with instructions he had stopped payments to Rothschild with respect to the new purchases of stock. He enclosed Rothschild's explanation, which set out the enormous difficulties in the way of undertaking journeys to and from England and safely conveying documents and letters in a time of war and blockade. Buddha strongly endorsed the remarks of his Frankfurt partner. In my opinion, he wrote, his judgment is sound and his request is justified. I have not yet informed War Councillor Lawrence of the investments made by Crown Agent Rothschild. It is not desirable that such information should be too widely known. He added that if the elector's instructions in this matter were not countermanded he would forthwith carry them out. The Bank of Riappel and Harnia, he continued, is, not to put too fine a point upon it, filled with absolute rage against your electoral highness. Although they owe their fortune entirely to your highness, they behave like madmen, instead of keeping quiet as they ought, and doing their duty by their customers, whom they serve for profit. In a second letter Buddhas wrote, Rothschild is unjustly accused of having, from motives of secret advantage, delayed the Dutch business, which is probably to the great detriment of your highness's interest. For it is Rothschild alone who has collected such sums as have reached your electoral highness, while the other bankers have made no effort whatever in the matter. Meanwhile one of the younger Rothschild brothers, probably Karl, arrived at Prague with a detailed report from Buderus, in which that official strongly urged his master not to jeopardize the business of the English investments, which was proceeding so well. Young Rothschild employed all his powers of eloquence to persuade the elector to revoke his veto regarding further payments. He thought that he had gained his object, and wrote to Buderus from Prague, stating that the elector had graciously agreed to continue to invest in British stocks the interest received in England. Buderus thereupon immediately resumed his payments to Rothschild on the elector's account, until he received an instruction from his master, dated December 9, 1811, which did not confirm Rothschild's premature conclusion. Thereupon Buderus made a further effort to impress upon his master that it was in his highest interest finally to cancel the veto on further payments, since otherwise the Rothschild banking firm would be faced with a severe crisis. It is my duty, he wrote 
to bear witness to the fact that the Rothschild bankers have not failed to make every possible effort to obtain the certificates of the investments, and your electoral highness can have no conception how difficult it is to send important documents between here and London. If your highness will consider the dangers that would arise if such a document were to fall into the wrong hands you will surely realize that all precautions which human ingenuity can devise must be taken in order to reduce to a minimum the chances of such an occurrence. The withholding of further payments to the Rothschild bankers has not increased their efforts to obtain the documents, as these efforts could not be increased. Directly after his return from Prague, the young Crown agent Rothschild travelled to the sea coast in order to seek an opportunity for bringing over these documents. He did not feel secure in a Dutch village where he was staying, and went across to Dunkirk, where he has to furnish daily to the police department a satisfactory reason for his living there. According to his last letter, he expects the documents to arrive at any moment and he will then hasten here without any loss of time. The power of attorney sent to the bankers Van Notten, under date October 28, 1810, authorizing the transfer of the old stock, under another pseudonym, has been recovered. After leaving Amsterdam, the ship was driven back to the coast, and my letter was delivered in a Dutch village, where a reliable acquaintance of the banker Rothschild has kept it until now. The young Crown agent Rothschild has now taken advantage of a favorable opportunity to forward it, and has received an assurance that it has safely reached the other side of the channel. Finally, young Rothschild, who had travelled to London, succeeded in smuggling over to the continent a certificate for £189,500 sterling, and this was immediately forwarded to the elector. William now again consented to the interest on his capital being used for effecting further investments, after noting with satisfaction that the house of Rothschild, which had been highly nervous about retaining this business, had reduced its terms, and declared that it was now willing to deliver the stock for 70% commission. The elector expressed his pleasure in conveying this information to Budarus, and concluded his letter by saying, I do not fail to realize the difficulties involved in communicating with London, and am therefore exceedingly happy to be in possession of the certificates for £189,500 sterling. The elector also expressed the wish that one of the brothers Rothschild should reside permanently at Prague, but this Budarus had to refuse. The operations of the family were already so extensive that, with the best will in the world, it was impossible to accede to this request. Budarus wrote to his master. Flattering though the suggestion is that one of the Rothschild sons should be allowed to reside permanently in the neighborhood of your electoral highness, it is no less impossible than flattering. Their father is old and sick. His eldest son, Emil Mayer, and his second son, Solomon, who is also delicate, are indispensable to him in his extensive operations. The third son, Karl, is almost continually engaged in traveling in the service of your electoral highness, while the fourth son, Nathan, is very usefully established in London, and the youngest, James, spends his time between London and Paris. They have declared to me that they will spare no effort to carry out your highness's commands. The continental blockade was naturally the chief cause of the great difficulties in the way of communications with England. This question had indeed become the crucial problem in general European politics. At Erfurt the opinion had obtained for a time in 1808 that Napoleon and Alexander of Russia would be able to share the dominion of Europe between them. The Emperor of France had particularly in view that he might finally be enabled to subdue England with the assistance of Russia. For this purpose it was essential that Russia should unconditionally adopt the continental blockade. But the Tsar never contemplated sacrificing all his trade with England for the sake of Napoleon. On the contrary, he facilitated the import of goods by sea, and goods of English origin could now easily find their way to other continental states via Russia. Thus the effectiveness of Napoleon's measures was endangered, and as early as the summer of 1811 it was obvious to the whole of Europe that a complete breach between the two most powerful continental states was inevitable, and that war was now only a question of time. The Napoleonic police consequently applied a much more rigid censorship to all correspondence and secret agreements in territories subject to French rule. Anything addressed to be the ruling family of Hesse was subjected to a particularly close scrutiny. A letter dated Frankfurt, November 1, 1811, 
which carelessly mentioned Mayor Amel's name in two places, and was addressed to the elector's brother, Landgrave Karl, fell into the hands of the French. In one passage the unknown writer acknowledged the receipt of a letter from the Landgrave, through the good offices of Mayor Amel, while another passage read as follows. I deliberately read to Rothschild, in his son's presence, the passage in which Your Highness speaks of them so kindly and graciously. They were all delighted. It was clear from the context that the letter referred to the Tugend Fund of which the Landgrave was a member, and it was a question of payments which Rothschild had to make on the Landgrave's behalf. This letter was immediately forwarded from Hamburg, where it had been intercepted, to General Savary, the Commissioner of Police at Paris, who instructed Baron Barker, the French ambassador at Frankfurt, to furnish any light he could as to the implication of the letter and the parts played by the persons mentioned in it. Baron Barker suggested that they should not proceed against the family Rothschild by domiciliary search and arrest as in 1809, but should act with greater cunning. The house of Rothschild and the other agents of the elector should be lulled into a complete sense of security. Their letters should be skillfully opened, copied, and then forwarded. In this way Barker hoped in a very short time to familiarize himself with their network of intrigue and all its complicated ramifications. The chief commissioner of police also asked for a report from his commissioner at Mainz, and the letter informed him that the House of Rothschild had formerly been exceedingly active in the trade of colonial goods and English manufactures. But since they had been subjected to a domiciliary search and had had their English goods sequestrated, they had occupied themselves principally with banking business, and commerce in goods confined to the continent. The Mainz commissioner added that the head of the house was not friendly toward France although he pretended that he was sincerely attached to that country. Barker's advice was taken. The brothers Rothschild were most carefully watched by agents of the French Imperial State Police, both in Frankfurt and in France, where they were amongst those who carried on illicit trade with England subject to departmental authorizations. At the same time they were on the best of terms with Dolberg's Frankfurt Police, although this force was also subject to Napoleon. Dolberg's police commissioner, Von Istein, who although a Jew, was director of the police of the Grand Duchy, was a particular patron of Mayor Emil and of all the Frankfurt Jews. Mayor Emil Rothschild had long cherished the idea of exploiting Dahlberg's friendly feelings for the Jews in the interests of the fellow members of his faith who had formerly been so oppressed, and incidentally of his own family. It is true that a new status proclaimed by Dahlberg had somewhat improved their condition, but it involved no essential change. For example, the number of Jewish families tolerated remained at 500. 500, only five, indignantly wrote a certain Israel Jacobson. Why not more, and why not less? Dahlberg, seeing that he could exploit this situation and do a good business deal, allowed Mayor Emil and his partner Gumprecht to persuade him to commute the annual amount of 22,000 gulden payable by the Jews into a lump sum, and to grant them the rights of citizenship in Frankfurt, thereby making them the political equals of the Christians. At the same time, the Jews were granted their own governing body, known as the governing body of the Israelite religious community. Police Director von Istein was nominated president, while the other members of the committee were chosen from amongst the most prominent Jews in the town. In the course of his efforts Mayor Emil let Dahlberg infer that the Jews were prepared to make financial sacrifices, and in the end Dahlberg demanded that they should commute the annual payment of 22,000 gulden by a single payment of 20 times that amount. This was a substantial amount of money, but one that the Frankfurt Jews could produce, especially as Mayor Emil alone advanced 100,000 gulden, or almost a quarter of the total sum. He also managed to arrange that only 150,000 of the 440,000 gulden should immediately be paid in cash, and that for the balance 24 bearer debentures would be accepted. Jewish circles awaited with considerable suspense, the conclusion of these arrangements, which were so important for their future. If the proposal went through, Mayor Emil wanted to be the first to bring the good news to the fellow members of his faith. As he was constantly being begged for information by members of the Jewish community, he requested a recorder of the province, who was friendly to him, to let him have the earliest possible information, I should be most pleased, he wrote to him in his peculiar German, if I could be the first messenger of the good news, as soon as it has been signed by His Royal Highness, 
our most excellent lord and great duke, in our favour and that I can inform my nation of their great joy, will you graciously inform me of it through the post? I confess I abuse your goodness and grace, but I do not doubt that your highness and your honoured family have to await great heavenly rewards and will receive much happiness and blessing. Because in truth our whole jury, if they have the happiness to obtain equal rights, will gladly pay with great pleasure all dues that the citizens have to pay. After some time the matter was put through, and aroused as much enthusiasm amongst the Jews as indignation in the Senate and amongst the patrician families, who were hostile to them. It was at once suggested. Everywhere that Dahlberg had received money personally, in addition to the sum publicly mentioned. In this connection pointed remarks were made about the fact that Mayor Emil and his sons had been appointed official bankers to the Grand Duchy and that Mayor Emil had been made a member of the Electoral College of Frankfurt. A member of the Austrian secret police actually claimed that he knew the amount of the sum, namely 33,000 Carolins, which Dolberg had received for his good offices. The Jewish community certainly had every reason to be grateful to the aged and infirm Mayor Emil, who had never completely recovered since his operation, and yet still had the energy to apply all his influence and money to secure this improvement in their status. The debentures, to the value of 290,000 gulden, were immediately brought into circulation. One of them, of the value of 50,000, was acquired by Dahlberg's finance minister, Count Christian von Benzel Sternau. Eight debentures of 10,000 gulden each were taken over by Herr von Bethmann, while the greater part of the amount paid by the Jews in cash went direct to Paris as a payment on account of the electoral domains in Fulda and Hanau, which had been seized by the French, and which Dolberg had repurchased on taking over these two principalities. The Grand Duke immediately sold the domains again to private persons for earnest money of three and own half million francs, payable by instalments, a transaction which, when concluded, would yield 190,000 francs more than France had received for the domains. When the bargain was concluded Dahlberg declared, with somewhat premature joy, a transaction concluded in so masterly a manner deserves a reward, and awarded the ministers who had been principally employed in the transaction, and their wives, with presents of 40,000 francs each. In the letter regarding this matter he stated, Since I am determined to gain nothing by this business except the welfare of the state, there are still 70,000 francs available out of the 190,000 realized. Of this amount I give 10,000 francs to Privy Councillor von Istein as a reward for services rendered in converting into cash the debts of the Jews to the state. I give 10,000 francs to the House of Rothschild for their excellent cooperation. I shall leave the remaining 50,000 francs with the House of Rothschild, as a part payment of what I owe them. The Senate of the City of Frankfurt, and the exiles who had formerly been in power, observed these events with concern and ill will, and were firmly determined, if matters should take a different turn, to do everything possible to undo what had been done. Mayor Emil's conduct had made him by no means popular with the former authorities of the city. But for the time being they had to look on in impotence, and allow him and his protector Dahlberg to have their way. It was with the greatest suspense that they watched the course of general European politics. The points at issue between Napoleon and Russia had already almost resulted in war. Napoleon collected the Grand Army, the greatest host that Europe had ever seen, in order to subdue the last independent monarch on the continent. At Dresden he gathered his dependent princes about him at a great court ceremony, and his imperial father-in-law Francis of Austria was also present on that occasion. The elector in Prague had again begged Francis to avail himself of the favourable opportunity for pleading his cause with the Emperor of France. Emperor Francis was used to such appeals, and paid no further attention to the letter. While the great drama of the Russian campaign was being enacted, the elector remained at Prague, and awaited the outcome of events in a state extreme anxiety. Napoleon's army was advancing steadily toward the heart of the Russian Empire although it was certainly suffering enormous losses. Out of an army of 400,000 men, scarcely 100,000 entered Moscow. But all that Europe saw was the victorious advance. Owing to the prevailing conditions it was weeks, even months, before further news reached Frankfurt. The merchants of that time could not adjust their affairs to events as speedily as scientific discoveries have now enabled them to do. 
Mayor Emil Rothschild's attitude was entirely determined by his sense of the overwhelming power of the Corsican, who was now at Moscow, when the reopening of his old wound quite unexpectedly brought him back to his sick bed. He did not live to see Napoleon's complete failure in Russia, to be followed a year later by his defeat in Germany, which was followed by the return to his Hessian domains of Rothschild's lord and master the elector. On September 16, 1812, a high Jewish feast day, the so-called Long Day, which is set apart for the pardoning of the penitent sinner, Mayor Emil had been fasting, in accordance with his strict religious principles, and spent many hours standing in the synagogue, sunk in prayer. The same evening he felt severe pains in the region of his wound. He was immediately put to bed, but his condition grew worse. He had violent attacks of fever, and he felt that death was approaching. Thereupon he determined, while he still had the strength in him, to order his affairs, and to make a new will adapted to the most recent developments, to take the place of the earlier will which he had made. In doing so he was giving effect to an agreement which he had made with all his children, and in accordance with which he sold to his five sons all his shares in the business, his securities and other possessions, as well as his large stocks of wine, for the sum of 190,000 gulden, which of course was far below their real value. His sons were henceforth to be the exclusive owners of the business, and it was clear, although not definitely stated, that after their father's death any inequality in their shares ceased, and each of the five sons henceforth possessed ten fiftieths, that is, a fifth share, in the business. The will completely excluded the daughters and their husbands and heirs from the business, and even from all knowledge of it. Mayor Emil applied of the purchase price of 190,000 gulden as follows, he granted his wife Gutel a life interest in 70,000 gulden. The remainder he divided amongst his five daughters. This arrangement served a double object. First, it made it unnecessary on his death to declare to the officials the enormous value, for those times, of the business that was divided between the five sons, and to put the capital bequeathed at the modest figure of 190,000 gulden. Secondly, the business was secured absolutely to the five sons, safe from the possibility of any interference from the sisters and their relations. The will concluded by enjoining unity, love and friendship upon the children, and any undutiful child that showed an intention of rebelling was threatened with the penalty of inheriting no more than the legal minimum, which was only to be reckoned on the basis of the 190,000 gulden, from which would have to be deducted anything that the child in question had received during his life. When Mayor Emil drew up his last will there cannot have been more than two of his five sons, namely Emil and Karl, at Frankfurt, for Solomon was living in Paris, and James, who was maintaining communication between Solomon and Nathan in England, was living at Gravelines on the Channel Coast in the Department Part de Calais. These facts, proved as they are by French police records, and the records of vices issued, are fatal to the well-known legend, according to which Mayor Emil gathered his five sons about his deathbed and divided Europe amongst them. Moreover, his illness had come on quite suddenly and developed so rapidly that the idea of recalling the sons who were abroad could never have been considered. When Mayor Emil had thus done everything that lay in his power to secure the future prosperity of his house, which, it is true, he considered in terms only of financial gain, and by clear and simple provision to maintain unity and peace amongst his numerous family, he could look death calmly in the face. Two days after he had completed his will, on the evening of September 19, 1812, his old complaint took a marked turn for the worse. The alpha and omega of medical practice of the time was to let blood, a procedure which simply served to weaken old people who were very ill, instead of giving them relief. At a quarter past eight on the evening of the same day, Mayor Emil Rothschild, the tireless, cunning, simple, and religious Jew, and founder of the banking firm M. A. Rothschild & Sons, was no longer to be counted amongst the living. In his last hours he was fully aware that he was leaving a fine inheritance to his sons, but he certainly could not have guessed that he had laid the foundation of a world power which during the first half of the nineteenth century was to exercise an unparalleled influence throughout Europe and was to maintain this influence almost unimpaired throughout the changing conditions of the second half of the century.